Okay, now let's talk about the basic new Keynesian model. Let's go through the math, the algebra behind such a model. And um, that is, we are going to look at the model equations. We were going to derive the optimality conditions of the household sector, of the firm sector. And note that I will focus on a quite simplified and basic new Keynesian uh, model. Um, that is, I will going to assume a linear production function. There's go not going to be capital in the model, but we will have nominal rigidities a la Calvo. So, in a sense, when we look at the model structure, the part of departure is more or less always the RBC model. So at the heart of new Keynesian models is basically what we know from the RBC literature. Okay, here we basically strip off capital and investment. We change the production function uh, compared to a standard RBC model and we introduce nominal rigidities. So there is just one country, okay? So there's a closed economy. We have perfectly competitive labor markets. Of course, there are new Keynesian models with wage rigidities as well, but let's keep things simple at first. Okay, so the major difference is that we will introduce price frictions. That is, not all the firms can adjust the prices in each period, or it is costly to adjust prices. Now, the representative household is more or less the same. It maximizes expected lifetime utility and it consumes and saves. Um, since we don't have capital, we will introduce uh, zero coupon bonds for, the for ha having an opportunity for the household to save and not consume. The household's income is basically base is based on wages and profits from the firm sector and the firm sector consists of actually two sectors. Okay, so first we have an intermediate goods sector where there is monopolistic competition. Okay, so each firm has some slight market power. It can slightly set their prices over marginal costs for their good. And the other sector is the end product sector. There is a certain assembly technology that assembles all those, a continuum of intermediate goods into just one single output good that can be consumed. The objectives of the intermediate good sector are to maximize lifetime profits, but we will introduce nominal rigidities in this sector. And the objective of um, the representative firm in the end product sector is also, of course, to maximize profits, but we will see then the only profits that there are are only where there's monopolistic competition, that is at the intermediate goods sector. And lastly, we will introduce stochastics in the model. And here you are basically free to introduce whatever you want. But often we have a productivity shock, in a sense, a supply shock. Um, we might have a preference shock resembling a demand shock. And for instance, a monetary policy shock resembling a policy shock. So this is the basic structure. Let's dive into each sector individually. So let's start with the household. The representative household maximizes present as well as expected uh, future utility. So ET is the conditional expectation operator based on information at period T. Beta here is the discount factor. So how patient is the household? How much does it value current consumption compared to future consumption? And now let's look into the functional form that I will use in this model. Um, it has basically three arguments. C is a consumption index that combines many different goods into one big index. And marginal utility of consumption is positive. So the household likes to have more consumption goods. Then there is a labor index, NTS, labor supply which corresponds to either hours worked or employed household members. And here note that the marginal utility, if, if the household more, works more, is negative. And this is in parentheses, and I multiply this with Z. And Z is a preference shifter. Okay, this is basically shifting the discount factor up or down, making the household 
temporarily or permanently, more patient or less patient. And of course there are some parameters, so sigma is basically the risk aversion or the inverse of sigma is the so-called elasticity of substitution. So how elastic does consumption react when the interest rate goes up? Um, the inverse of phi is the so-called Frisch elasticity of labor. So how elastic does labor supply react when wages go up? Okay, now let's have a closer look into this consumption index C. So the consumption index is formed by assuming a continuum of goods represented by the interval uh, H between 0 and 1. And for aggregation of all these goods, CTH, these individual goods, we use a famous paper by Dixit and Stieglitz from the 70s who advocate using the CES function um, in order to formalize consumers' preferences for product variety. Now, the Dixit Stieglitz model basically states that the variety preference is already inherent in the assumption of monotonic preferences. Um, and a consumer with such preferences prefers to have basically an average of any two bundles of goods as opposed to extremes. Okay? We love to have the variety. And as the variety increases, we are better off. Okay, so this is uh, a model for the law of variety. And so this epsilon parameter which is by assumption larger than one, is also is often called the law of variety parameter. Okay, now let's have a look at the budget restriction of the household. So the budget constraint basically tells you that the expenditures on the left hand side must be less or equal to your income and wealth. And let's have a closer look at the expenditure side. Okay, so the household decides how much to spend, how much to allocate in consumption expenditures among the different goods uh, by taking the price of the goods as given and maximizing the whole consumption index for any given level of expenditures. Um, similarly, in each period, the household takes the nominal wage as given and supplies labor. Okay, he receives labor income. Um, the Firms at the intermediate goods sector, there might be profits because there's monopolistic competition in the intermediate goods sector and those profits are paid back to the household in, ter in, in terms of dividends. So these are the nominal dividends and we sum up over the continuum of intermediate firm, firms F from 0 to 1. And lastly, uh, the household is able to purchase a quantity, BT, of one period nominally riskless bonds at a price, Q, and the bond matures the following period and pays out one unit of money at maturity. Now, income and wealth are used to finance expenditures on consumption and savings. And in total, this defines the nominal budget constraint of the household. So this equality sign for an optimal allocation, this will actually be an equal sign. Our utility function is always increasing in consumption and always decreasing in labor. Um, we don't waste, uh, we will have a look at inner solutions. We don't waste resources here, for instance. Now let's have a closer look at the price of bonds and how it is related to the nominal interest rate and the real interest rate. Price of bonds is inversely related to nominal interest rates and this is more or less a standard result we have in macro. So when the interest rate goes up, the price of bond goes down. Now intuitively this makes sense because if you are paying less for a fixed nominal return at par, uh, your expected return should be higher. And more specifically to our model, we have so-called zero coupon bonds or discount bonds. And these bonds don't pay you any interest, but derive the, the value from the difference between the purchase price Q and the par value or the face value that is paid to you at maturity. And for us, this is just one. If we denote with uppercase R, the gross yield to maturity of a zero coupon bond, um, 
which is then the discount rate that sets the present value of the promised bond payments equal to the current market price of the bond. Okay, so this is this condition. And as there are no other investment opportunities in our model, this RT is also then what we call the nominal interest rate. And the last equation here is the Fisherian equation. Um, uppercase pi is the price level in T plus one divided by the price level in T. So this is gross inflation, expected gross inflation. And this basically tells you that the nominal interest rate is the product of the real interest rate times expected inflation. And in this equation, it is evident that the inflation expectations that are responsible for the difference between the nominal interest rate and the real interest rate. Okay, let's have a closer look at debt structure in this model. Is there actually debt? And this is quite interesting because even though we introduce the opportunity to purchase a bond, in equilibrium, bond holding is always zero in all periods. So this BT will actually be always zero. And this is due to the fact that in this model, we have a representative agent and only private bonds. So if all agents were borrowing, there would be nobody we could borrow from. Or if all agents were lenders, there were, nobody would like to borrow from them. So bonds across all agents need to be zero in net supply, as markets, of course, always need to clear. Very importantly, this bond market clearing condition is only imposed after we have derived our optimality conditions. Household savings behavior is a possibility in this model and we need to take this into account when the household decides how much, how much it spends on consumption expenditures. So this is very important that this needs to be consistent with the bond market clearing. In short, even though there is in the end no debt in the model, we still need to take this into account when deriving the optimal behavior of the households. There are also other models and then you would actually have debt in the equilibrium as well. And in such models, we require an end condition for describing optimal behavior. And this is often done either in the so-called solvency constraint. We explicitly forbid our agents from acquiring an infinite debt that is never repaid. Okay, so here the, the, the technical problem is that our planning horizon, our time horizon is infinity. So we need to basically think at this hypo, uh, hypothetical point in time, what happens to debt? We forbid the agent from acquiring an infinite debt that is never repaid. Okay, so in, in short, the solvency constraint um, prevents that households consume more than they earn and refinance their additional consumption expenditures with excessive borrowing. Now, there is a different condition that we also had in the RBC model, which is called the transversality condition. Now, the transversality condition is an boundary condition, an optimality condition that, is, that states that it is not optimal to start accumulating assets and never consume them. So this condition must be satisfied in order for the individual to maximize intertemporal utility. And this implies that the wealth at the limit should be zero. In other words, if at the limit wealth is actually positive, it means that the household could have increased consumption without necessarily needing to work more hours, which would imply higher lifetime utility. And this means consumption was not maximized and therefore contradicting the fact that the household behaves optimal. So in short, this transversality condition makes sure that households do not have any leftover savings in terms of bonds or capital, as this does not correspond to, to an optimal path of utility enhancing consumption. Now, interestingly, we never need to really impose this condition into, say, a Dynair code or a MATLAB code. But implicitly, we have to think about this condition. And we do this by, for instance, picking a certain steady state value or a certain trajectory. 
Uh, for instance, we assume that steady states of many variables are positive. So we rule out uh, corner conditions and this implicitly fulfills the transversality condition. Now, coming back to this model, bond holding is always zero you know, for an optimal allocation. So these two conditions are always fulfilled in all periods. So these two conditions are rather trivial in this model, but for more complicated models, those are two things that you need to think about. Now let's have a look at the optimality conditions of the household. So let's first have a look at the consumption cost minimization problem. Okay, so this fancy dixit stiglitz aggregation technology, um, how does the household actually decide how much to allocate, how much consumption expenditures to allocate among the differentiated goods um, by taking the price of the good PTH as given and maximizing the actual consumption index by CT for any given level of expenditures. And this has implications for a price aggregation and also then for the budget constraint. But now let's do this formally. So the household minimizes consumption expenditure expenditures. Okay, and we can do this with a Lagrange approach. So this is our objective function and we have a Lagrange multiplier. Let's already call this PT and we will see why in a second. And the Dixit Stiglitz aggregator is the constraint here. So does it make sense to call the Lagrange multiplier already with the aggregate price index? Well, what is a Lagrange multiplier? It is the cost of an additional unit in the constraint, in the consumption, an additional unit costs PT. So it does make sense. Let's take the derivative with respect to CTH. So even though this is an integral, there's only one CTH in here and the derivative is PTH and CTH is right here, minus one times epsilon minus one divided by epsilon times CTH and the inner derivative as well. And this is supposed to be all equal to zero. Now this here can be simplified by using the Dixit-Stieglitz aggregation technology right here. So simplifying, okay, so this over here is actually CT1 over epsilon. Okay, this means that I can simplify the whole expression. So this is the actual demand function for each consumption good, CTH. And accordingly, the epsilon, the law of variety parameter, is the demand elasticity. And in the Dixit-Stieglitz case, this is constant. For other aggregation technologies, for instance, the Kimball aggregator, uh, you get varying um, elasticities, but in the Dixit-Stieglitz case, this is always constant. It doesn't matter if we have high or low prices, the elasticity is always the same. Now, let's plug this into the aggregation technology. Okay, so the aggregation technology, again, was this expression over here. Let's move this over here, get rid of that. And this will be epsilon minus one divided by epsilon. Plug in this equation right here, and this can be further simplified. So we have the same on the left hand side as in the right hand side. And then also let's move the PT over and get rid of the exponent. So similar to the aggregation technology, we have an aggregation of prices. Okay, so this Lagrange multiplier uh, can be interpreted as the aggregation technology for the different prices, which is quite nice. And in the budget constraints, the last implication of, or the implication of these two equations is that in the budget constraint, we have this equation here, the consumption expenditures, right? And if we now plug in our demand function for CTH, we can pull out one PT and one CT and we are left with 
And if you have a look at this equation and this one, dividing by PT, we can pull it in into the integral and then we have the same equation right here. We have a one here, taking the exponent away. This is actually just equal to one. So the whole expression is PT times CT. All right, so the sum of all the consumption expenditures must equal the product of the aggregate price index and the aggregate consumption index, which is such an obvious equation, but still we need to derive this formally. And we can then plug this in into the budget constraint and continue with our optimality conditions. Household optimality is then given by two very important equations. The first determines, so this is basically determining labor supply. And the other one tells me something about how much, how I value or how the household values consumption today compared to consumption tomorrow. Now let's derive those two equations formally. Due to our assumptions, the solvency constraint, the transversality condition, um, we have a concave optimization problem, so we can actually rule out corner conditions. So in the budget constraint, again, we can get rid of the inequality sign and simply uh, use the equality sign. And moreover, because it's concave and we have a, um, a bounded set, a bounded constraint, um, we can just look at first order conditions, which then de define the maximum. So let's do this again with the Lagrange approach. So the Lagrange of Lagrangian of the households is it wants to what's the objective function? It wants to maximize lifetime utility times u c t plus j and t plus j s and z t plus j some utility function plus an infinite amount of constraints. We need to put a Lagrange multiplier on this and I decide to also discount the Lagrange multipliers. And here I'm going to put the budget constraint um, plus the amount of bonds we're getting back in real terms. So this is divided by P T plus J. And I'm going to do a trick here. I'm going to pt minus 1 plus j multiply and divide by the same previous price. Why? Because this divided by this is the actual real bond and this divided by this is the inflation rate. Okay, so this is outstanding bonds plus newly new bonds minus purchase bonds in real terms and minus consumption expenditures. Now the problem for the household is not to choose CT and NTS and BT all at once for all periods from T from zero to infinity all at once in an open loop policy, but in a closed loop policy. So in period T, let the household decide about CT, about NT, about uh, how much bonds to buy. Okay, and in the next period, let the household decide again, the same optimization problem on then CT plus one, uh, NT plus one, etc. Okay, so this is what I call a closed loop policy. Let's derive the first order condition with respect to CT. There is a CT right here and the CT is over here. So this boils down basically to lambda T equals marginal utility of consumption. And given the assumption I or given the functional form of the utility function, I let me include this already. This is the actual expression. 
the first order condition with respect to labor. Here is labor and we have labor here, all right, minus the marginal disutility of working divided the marginal utility of consumption. Or in a sense, with given our functional assumptions, this will be right here. So the first one is the marginal utility function. That is the shadow price of an additional unit of revenue. So dividends or when labor income. So dividends go up or something like that in the budget constraint. Okay, and this is the intra-temporal optimality condition, the labor choice, how much is the household going to work. And the preference shifter has no effect on this equation. Okay, there is no z here. Interesting. Now let's have a look at the first order condition with respect to bonds to real bonds. Okay, let's have a look. Where are my real bonds? No real bonds here. There. Well, actually, let's switch this around so you can maybe see it better. Okay, so we have real bonds and periods T only when the sum here is j equals 1. So I have to evaluate the sum at j equals 1. And I have real bonds right here for when I evaluate the sum at j equals 0. Now the first order condition with respect to bonds then becomes basically lambda t times qt equals beta times the expectation of lambda t plus 1 times the inverse of the inflation rate. Now let's combine this with our first optimality condition with marginal utility. We know that the price of the bond is inversely related to the nominal interest rate. So let's do this and we get Okay, so combined with this equation here, call this one, and QT is one over RT. We get, and this right here is actually the real interest rate due to the Fisherian equation. All right, and this is my so-called Euler equation, okay, the consumption savings decision. And this is characterized by a, an indifference condition. So one additional unit of consumption yields either marginal utility today in the amount of this here, so this is the left hand side or alternatively this unit of consumption can be saved okay and if I save it I gain times the real interest rate so I have this saved marginal unit of future consumption and in order to compare this I need to discount it to today so in an optimum is characterized that I'm indifferent between consuming today or saving and consuming it tomorrow. So this is the optimal allocation of those two choices and this is what we call the Euler equation. Okay, now let's talk about the firm sector. So remember we have an infinite amount of firms that creates intermediate goods and the market structure is monopolistic competition for them and we also have one representative firm that assembles those intermediate goods into one final consumption good. Now these firms, the intermediate goods firms, um, can earn a profit and this profit is paid back to the households uh, in terms of dividends. So firms are owned by the household and 
similar to when the household compares utility today compared to tomorrow, we need to discount this. And here we make, no, make use of the so-called stochastic discount factor to compare profits today with profits tomorrow from the viewpoint of the households. And the stochastic discount factor um, basically stems from the Euler equation. The stochastic discount factor is, inver is the inverse of the nominal expected nominal interest rate. And from the Euler equation, we can get this equation over here. This is the ratio of marginal utilities. The actual discount factor plays a role and the inflation rate between periods T and T plus J. Okay, so this is the stochastic discount factor. Having this equation, there are some special cases which we, we will need these expressions later when we rewrite a infinite sum in recursive form. Okay, so the stochastic discount factor for today, given today, is obviously one. For t and t plus j, if you iterate this and compare it for t plus one and t plus one plus j, you get, of course, this expression. And plugging using this and the previous one, we can also get an expression for t and not only t plus j, but also t plus one plus j. Okay, and here are the basic steps. Uh, you use the definition uh, and then you reuse these expression to get this expression right over here. Okay, now let's actually have a look at the final product or end product uh, sector. So we have this infinite amount of intermediate goods that are packed. So there's a packer that creates one big box and this box is the final good that can be consumed. Okay, and we again make use of the Dixit Stieglitz aggregation technology and similar as we just did for the household consumption aggregation, um, we arrive at profit maximization. So we have a demand schedule right here and epsilon, the law of variety, or minus epsilon is actually the constant elasticity, price elasticity of demand. And accordingly, the aggregate price index is a Dixit Stieglitz type aggregator of the prices of the intermediate goods. Let's derive this on paper. So the output packer maximizes, let's call this Lagrange P, um, maximizes profits plus, let's call this uppercase lambda TP, the constraint. And the constraint is always the Dixit Stieglitz aggregation technology. So the first order condition with respect to yt equal to zero. And if I rearrange, we can actually note that the Lagrange multiplier needs to be equal to the aggregate price index, which makes sense, right? This is a shadow price. So if output, if I buy one more output good, what is the optimal value of how much my expected pro of, of how much my profits, my overall profits go down. So there's a minus here, minus the price, of course. Now the first order condition with respect to YTF, note that from the aggregation technology and from the just derived optimality condition. Okay, so note that, that we have those two equations given. So we can simplify this equation right here. Okay, so this will then give me, and rearranging then yields the demand schedule. Okay, so this is the demand curve for intermediate good YTF, constant elasticity, price elasticity, or demand elasticity. And the aggregate price index is again implicitly defined. We insert the demand curve into our aggregation technology. Okay, so we end up at, and this can be again rearranged to. Okay, so this is profit maximization of the final product sector firms. Now let's have a look at the objective function of the intermediate goods firms. First of all, we, are, we need to take a stand on the production function. And here we make it very simple. We are simply assuming 
a linear production function and given a common technology AT for all the firms. So YTF is the individual good of firm F and NTD is the labor demanded to produce this using this production function and the common technology A. Now the real profits are obviously what is sold minus labor, real labor costs. And we can also look at nominal profits or nominal dividends and the present value of these are um, the real profits time the times the corresponding price index discounting this with the stochastic discount factor because those firms are owned by the household. The objective of the firm is to choose contingent plans for PTF, which price it, it sets and how much labor it hires so as to maximize the uh, expected present value of nominal div dividends. Now let's first have a look at the optimal labor demand before we have a look at the optimal choice of prices. Okay, so here's basically the, the optimality condition for optimal labor demand. Let's derive this. So the Lagrangian of the firm is what is sold minus, so I have revenues minus real costs plus a Lagrange multiplier and the constraint is the production function. Okay, and this Lagrange multiplier, I'm calling this MC already for marginal costs. Um, why? Because this is the shadow price of producing an additional output unit in the optimum. And obviously producing an additional output un unit in the optimum is costs you what we call marginal costs. What is the optimal labor demand? So even though this is an infinite sum, there is no spillover of today's labor choice to tomorrow's labor choice or the other way around. So it more or less boils down to a static problem. Okay, so the stochastic discount factor, we derived those on, on the previous slide. For T and T is just one and the PTs, they cancel. So I only have the labor here and productivity here. So if I set that this equal to zero and simplify a bit, I'm getting using the definition of the production function, I can also write it like this. So this is the labor demand equation, okay, which is quite interestingly because looking here, this implies that the output to labor ratio must be always equal to the productivity and as productivity is independent of F, this holds for every firm. Okay, so the output to labor ratio needs to be equal always to A for each firm F. And because all firms face the same factor prices, all firms have access to the same um, production technology um, from this equation is actually evident that the marginal costs of F, we can rewrite them, are independent of F. So they are always equal to the ratio of real wage to productivity. Of course, this is due to the fact that we're using a linear production function. This becomes slightly more difficult if you use, for instance, Cobb Douglas production functions with capital choice as well. Aggregate marginal costs, let's take the sum, is of course also equal to this expression. Okay, now what about the prices that the firm set? And here um, I'm following the approach introduced by Calvo and developed further by Jun to how to include nominal rigidities. And the idea here is that each firm F faces in each period a constant probability one minus theta of being able to re-optimize its price PTF. So we have these two cases with probability one minus theta, the firm is allowed to re-optimize its price and with probability theta, it cannot re-optimize. And here I'm assuming it is stuck at the current price level. Okay, so due to this 
uh, structure with probabilities. You can also intuitively understand is that a certain fraction of the firms, one minus theta, is allowed to change prices and a fraction theta of the firms is not allowed and they simply set the previous period's price. Okay, so this PTF tilde is the re-optimized price in period T. So this is the Calvo and Jung mechanism for nominal rigidities, meaning prices are not flexible, we can only re-optimize this with a certain probability. From the firm's perspective, there is a probability to be stuck at a certain price for a certain amount of time j. And this probability is equal to theta raised to the power of j. And of course then my objective is, I'm faced with this probability to be stuck at this price and I want this price to be such that it maximizes my expected profits until I can re-optimize again. The horizon is until I'm able to re-optimize my price. So this is why I have this theta raised to the power of j in my objective function. Let's do this. So this is the whole objective for the case that the firm is stuck for a certain amount of periods or forever. And let's just focus on the parts that are important with when we optimize with respect to the price plus other terms that are not dependent on PTF tilde. Now, the first order condition with respect to PTF tilde is setting it to zero. So this would be zero equals, okay. PTF is greater than zero. And also note that PTF, because we're stuck at this price, is not dependent on J. Okay, so we can simply multiply by PTF. Okay, rearranging. Okay, and now dividing both sides by PT epsilon plus one. Okay, so dividing yields, there's one PT and the other PT raised to the power of epsilon, we put this into the sum. Okay, and we will call this as one T and we will call this as two T. And I'm going to call this the optimal reset price as lowercase pt tilde. And note that I'm dropping the f here. Okay, in my definition of this pt tilde. Why? Because if you have a look, this is independent of f and this is also independent of F. So the ratio between the actual price set of each individual firm to the current price level is always the same and, and independent of F, which means all firms set the same price, okay? So if allowed to reset the price, they set the same price. Okay, so basically we have the reset price is equal to now those two infinite sums look heavy, right? But we can actually use, rewrite them or re-express them recursively. And to do this, we are going to make use of our definitions of the stochastic discount factor. So let's start with the first recursive sum. So S1T is equal to this expression right here. Now let's evaluate this at j equals zero and we end up because the stochastic discount factor is for j equals zero equals one, pt divided by pt, anything, so this is just one, yt. Okay, so this would just be yt plus, but 
starting at j equals 1. Okay, and I have a j over here, I have a j over here, and I have a j over here, and here. So let me start the sum again at 0. Let's start at 0. So we need to increase the j by 1. And we need to increase t plus j plus 1. Okay, now let's duplicate this again. And let's include something right here. So let's pull this over here, divided by pt plus 1 times pt plus 1, which means I have now j equals 0. Let's go back to the expressions we derived for the stochastic discount factor. So we have lambda t, t plus 1 plus j, which we also have, and this is equal to this equation, to this part right here. Okay, let's introduce this into our derivations here. Beta times lambda t plus 1 divided by lambda t divided by pt plus 1, the inverse, times lambda t t plus j plus 1. Okay, so this is this guy over here is equal to this. And times times y t plus j plus 1. Okay, and we're almost done. Now let's have a look. Let's get all those terms that do not depend on j out of the sum. Oh, sorry. And I have a plus one here. This is just right here. Sorry. Okay, so I have a epsilon minus one right here. And the rest is dependent on j. So the... And now, if you have a look, this guy over here is S1t plus 1. Let's have a look. S1t is this expression right here. And this is exactly the same expression, just evaluating at t plus 1. So to sum up, we have expressed S1t recursively times s1 t plus 1. Cool. So this is the first sum and the second sum is totally similar. We just have an additional term in there. Okay, so let's have a look. And again, the same trick. So let's evaluate everything at j equals 0. All right. Okay, now let's start the sum again at j equals 0. And then again, inside the parentheses here. Let's divide by pt plus 1 and multiply by pt plus 1. And then get the expression for the stochastic discount factor of t and with t plus j plus 1. Okay, and this is this term right here. Now let's get everything out of the sum that is independent of j. This over here is s2t plus 1. So we can rewrite the whole expression as s2t equals yt times marginal cos t plus theta beta times s2t plus 1. 
So these are the optimal price setting equations expressed recursively using our definition of those two sums here. So now due to the Calvo mechanism, that is that only with a certain probability firms can actually reset their prices, we can also derive the law of motion for the optimal reset price of firms that are able to optimize today. And this is equal to this equation here. And this equation basically stems from the Calvo dynamics. Let's have a look. So the aggregate price index is given by this equation right here. Now due to the Calvo mechanism, we have a certain amount on this interval of, let's call them optimizers, plus non-optimizers. And the optimizers, they always set the same price. Okay, see, so, and this price is independent of F. This will always be PT tilde. So in this first integral, there is nothing dependent on F anymore. And how many of those optimizers do we have? Well, it is the fraction one minus theta. Okay, they will set the following price. And what about the non-optimizers? Well, the remaining fraction, theta, is actually stuck with the old price. And in the previous periods, we had the same law of motion. Okay, so here we actually have, again, 0 to 1, pt minus 1 of f, pt. And now let me do a little trick so that we can rewrite this. Okay, so here, this is what I call lowercase pt tilde, one minus epsilon plus theta times, let's pull out the pt minus one and the pt and and if you have a look at this equation or this term here, this is the same as here, just for period t minus one. But the left hand side is independent of t. So this one, this expression is simply one. So we have one minus theta pt tilde, so we have one equals plus theta times pt epsilon minus one. And this is the law of motion for the optimal reset price. Good, now let's talk about market clearing. Um, we've already seen that the bond market due to the, our representative household assumption is always zero after computing the optimality conditions, of course. Now labor markets need to clear, which means that labor supply needs to be equal to labor demand. The equi equilibrium amount of labor is simply NT without the S and the D superscript. Aggregate real profits. Um, let's create a new variable for this. Let's call it simply div T. And this is the integral of the profits of the intermediate goods firms. And those are actually equal to this here. And aggregate demand is equal to, that means that output must be equal to consumption. Let's derive these equations real quickly. Okay, now labor market clearing implies that whatever the households supply needs to meet demand. And demand is given by the demand of the intermediate firms. Okay, and let's simply call this NT, whatever this amount is. Now, given the demand for good YTF, okay, so we have YTF was equal to, now let's have a look what happens when we aggregate the expenditures on the intermediate goods. Okay, so let's integrate 
YTF times PTF DF. Okay, so let's include this here. We get, and this is equals to. So, and from the definition of the aggregate price index, we know that this is one. So actually this is equals to PT times YT. Okay, and we now have this equation here and we have this equation here. Let's plug this in into aggregate real profits. So the aggregate real profits are the aggregated profit, profits, which is then minus. Okay, so we just arrived at PTF times YTF. If we take the integral, this is equal to PTYT divided by PT, it's just YT. And moreover, WT put it out and we have the integral of NTDF, which we just said this is NT. Okay, so this is minus WT times NT. Those are aggregate real profits. And now we can revisit the budget constraint. Okay, the model needs to close. Okay, so we need to revisit the budget, for instance, whether the left-hand side is still equal to the right-hand side. And now with all the stuff that we derived, this becomes PT times CT divided by PT plus QT times BT, which is actually zero. So BT is always zero and we have WT times NT and plus yt minus wt times nt. So ct equals yt. And this is aggregate demand. What about aggregate supply? And aggregate supply is a bit more difficult because here we have to take into account the price rigidities. So something is not really efficient. Okay, we have an inefficiency here and we measure this by the so-called price inefficiency distortion. So how much different is the price of the firms compared to the overall price index? And there's actually also a law of motion for this price inefficiency distortion, which as you see, there is a theta and a theta here is basically um, stems from the Carver pricing assumption. So let's derive this equation as well. So let's define a helper variable yt sum is the sum of all ytfs. Using the production function we get, which we know we can pull out at and the integral of ntd, we call that nt. So yt sum is on the one hand at times nt. But yt sum is on the other hand Okay, so but also now we also have the demand function here. Okay, and so taking the sum over this equation tells us that the sum is not equal to only yt, but it is multiplied by this price inefficiency distortion. And let's call this price inefficiency distortion PT star. And now equating both yt sum expressions, we get pt star times yt equals a times nt. And this is the aggregate supply equation. Now we have price frictions and this is evident right here. And this means that resources will not be efficiently allocated because prices are too high and not all firms can re-optimize their price, okay? In every period, so they set prices too high, basically. And this inefficiency distortion, okay, so PT star is less or equal than one.
again due to the Calvo mechanism, I can also get an equation or a law of motion for the price inefficiency distortion. Okay, so similar to what we just did with the optimal reset price, we have a look at PT star, which is zero to one, which is then again optimizers plus non-optimizers. Now optimizers always set the same price and there the probability for that is one minus theta. So the fraction one minus theta always sets PT tilde minus epsilon plus the remaining theta, they're stuck at their, the old price. So zero to one, PT minus one, divided by PT. And I'm doing the same trick. So, so this is equal to times PT minus one divided by PT minus epsilon times zero one pt minus one of f and this is very similar to what i have here just evaluate at t minus one so this is pt minus one star so to sum up pt star is equal one minus theta, pt tilde minus epsilon plus theta. This is the inflation rate or the inverse of that one times pt minus one star. Okay, so now we've derived everything there is to the household sector and to the firm sector. Now, the, there are two things missing to close the model. First of all, we have a policy sector as well, so we need to take a stance on what does monetary or fiscal policy do. And in this model, I'm, I'm taking it easy, just including monetary policy, and monetary policy just follows a feedback rule. So they're able to set the nominal interest rate equal to a certain value they target, the steady state, and then they react to deviations from the inflation rate to an inflation target, say those 2% annually or 0.5% quarterly. And this is the coefficient that measures the, the hawkishness of the monetary policy rule. The higher the theta phi, the more drastic does monetary policy react to inflation deviations. But they also might care about output gap. Okay, so there's a coefficient phi y, which measures the deviation from steady state output. And everything else that is not captured by this rule, that is unexpected or does not conform to a rule, so some error maybe, that is captured by this new variable. This is the monetary policy shock. And we also introduce more, even more stochastics. Um, remember there's a preference shifter at the household sector, which more or less uh, resembles a demand shock. And this shifter follows an AR1 process. There's a innovation to this process, epsilon Z. Productivity evolves to an AR1 process there is an innovation to this epsilon a and the monetary policy shock um, is also an AR1 process and this is actually what we then call the monetary policy innovation or the monetary policy shock and for those shocks we assume they are for instance Gaussian they have a mean of zero and they're even uncorrelated uh, so we think so in a sense, we're thinking about structural shocks. So this is really a preference shock. This is a TFP shock, and this is a monetary policy shock. All right, so this is the basic new Keynesian model. Let me now give you a overview of all the model equations that we just derived and that constitute the basic new Keynesian model.
with a linear production function and nominal frictions are like halvable. Now, those are the model equations so far. Not all of them are required. You could substitute out a couple of those equations, but it doesn't matter. Those are the 17 equation, okay? So the equation for the nominal interest rate inversely related to the price of bonds, the Fisherian equation for the real interest rate, the intratemporal choice for labor supply, then the intertemporal choice for consuming and saving, the Euler equation. This is marginal costs. This, uh, this equation together with these two equations determines optimal price setting. Now this is aggregate demand. This is the definition of aggregate profits. This is the law of motion for the optimal reset price. And those two, this is aggregate supply and this is the law of motion for the price inefficiency distortion. And here we have the law of motions for the, sorry, the preference shifter for technology and for the monetary policy shocks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 equations. And if you count, we have 17 variables as well. So the model is square. The, that is always a good thing. Okay, there are probably a couple of mistakes in my derivations. Please let me know so I can update the description of the video and let everyone know as well. If you have any questions, feel free to raise them in the comments or write me an email. Have a good day.